Hello everyone. So after posting this last video that I posted today, the quick one, I realized that I am a complete mess. I felt miserable. I felt like my life was rapidly spiraling out of control. I called up Workman's Comp and told them that I was canceling my appointment with the hand specialist and um, I think I left a message with the Workman's Comp guy, but then there was also the doctor's office, which he texted me twice to let me know that I had two separate appointments that they had scheduled me for, and um, I could either confirm or reschedule those, and I texted back to say that I wasn't rescheduling until I felt like it, and I don't feel ready to do that at this time, and that I cannot make either of those two appointments, and um, I don't feel like rescheduling. I don't think I'm going to reschedule. I think I'm just going to wait six weeks and after six weeks I'm going to take this off and see if my finger is working and if my finger is working I'm going to assume that I'm healed. I do not want to see any more doctors for the foreseeable future. I also got a workout today which I haven't actually had a workout since this happened and it's been over a week and um, I am becoming more and more aware. I was already aware, but it's been very um, vividly clear to me that I am not the kind of person who can afford to miss a week's worth of exercise and, uh, and not fall apart in some way or another. Um, I, I need exercise to maintain any kind of mental stability. I, I need that. I've always known I needed it, but now I really know I need it because I I start to unravel fast. Um, add into that a little bit of sleep deprivation and definitely a lot of postpartum depression and you've got a crazy person on your hands. So um, I got I got a workout today and the the change to my mood was drastic and very immediate and so I have a little bit of energy now and I don't hate my life anymore and I feel like I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> oh God. And so um, since I have a little bit of energy, I figured, hey, let's let's dive into the tactical guide to women. Part one, risk management. Chapter two, where you're going. It pays to find out where your ship is headed before you start taking on passengers. The problem is that values are tough to pin down. I think there would be far fewer ugly divorces if values were easy to define. So in this chapter he talks about values and I thought that was a wonderful and very refreshing idea when it comes to relationships and how to maintain healthy relationships. It is very different from the rational male perspective that human beings are just driven by instincts. Yes, human beings are driven by instincts, but they're driven by more than instincts. So this helps to give us a richer, broader idea of the different motivations that drive human beings within the context of a relationship. It's not just your instinctive drives for, ooh, alpha male, um, you know, ooh, not so much with the beta male, or, or as a male looking at women, ooh, I like the pretty. Um, there's more to it than that. There's more to people than that. And so it's been a very fun chapter for me to look at it and see, see information on relationships that I've never actually encountered before. This is new for me. And so the first thing I did when I was reading it was I, I called up my husband. I was like, what do you think about this? Like, what are, what are your values? Like going through his list of values that he has, it's like, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you, what is your, your hierarchy of values here that you've got for yourself? And then we compared and contrasted and looked at the things that I thought he would value versus the things that he thought he would value, which we know each other pretty well. There were no surprises there. Um, it was a very fun chapter for us. And very early in the book, but I am already recommending this to people that I know, especially like young people who might be in relationships or might be single, and hoping to find a good relationship. It's like, you should take a look at this. This is really good. It's good generic advice for how to form healthy relationships, which is, it's the goal. I mean, if you're going to be in a relationship, it might as well be a healthy one. Otherwise, it's just no good. For example, one of the most common sources of conflict among couples is money. But do couples really fight about money? In my clinical experience, couples fight about what money represents. It might represent security to one partner and freedom to another. 
Money is a solid proxy for big universal questions about life priorities, appetite for risk, tolerance for deferred gratification, and even how to express love. Yet instead of discussing the core value differences money may represent, many couples simply end up shouting ineffectually about the visa bill. That's really interesting to me because I never thought about it that way. I know that couples fight about money. I know that money is one of the big things that drives people apart in relationships. The idea that it wasn't just money and that it was something behind the money. Um, my husband and I actually don't fight about money, weirdly enough. Um, I've always been a very avid saver and he's always been a builder. And so between the two of us, He's in charge of our finances, and he invests the money into things that he thinks are going to grow it and expand it, and I typically don't spend the money, so between the two of us, it's pretty, pretty easy to maintain a, a, a nice, you know, even keel. Um, I will say that I do ask him for things that are very expensive from time to time. I don't ask for cheap things. I don't ask for particularly affordable things. Um, I don't ask him for frivolous things either. I don't ask him for fancy purses or expensive jewelry. I hit him where it hurts. I ask him for things that are extraordinarily expensive, like, let's have another kid. Which, by the way, very expensive. Social psychologist Shalom Schwartz, 2012, studied cultures across the globe and found 10 universal values that motivate people. You could find people in Japan, Zimbabwe, or any other location who could find their primary motivators somewhere in Schwartz's list. And he has here a very simple, straightforward, bulleted list of 10 values and 10 things that people might prioritize in life. And I mean, some of them, some of them, I'm, I'm not going to list all of them, but some of them make a lot of sense. Security, safety and harmony in, 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 in society and relationships, that makes a lot of sense. Do you value security or is security maybe not so valuable to you as power or stimulation, variety and adventure? Um, there's also gratification and comfort. Um, there's tradition. There's self-direction. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, things that people would value and people have hierarchies of these values. So you might value everything on the list, but some of them you're going to value slightly more. And those things that you value slightly more are going to motivate you just that little bit extra. And life is a series of compromises between these different values. So knowing what it is that motivates you, um, is very, very important because if you settle down with a partner who is motivated differently than you are and those values conflict, um, it can get kind of rocky. Whereas Schwartz's list was pretty philosophical, this list captures a more nuts and bolts snapshot of a person's ideal daily life. Let's call them the Big Ten since I'll be referring to them later. He then provides another list of values and this is where I got really excited because it's like okay so there's the first list of values and I go through that and it's like okay this is very interesting and then he gives us another list of values and so I went through that and that was very interesting and these are slightly different um, things like career, caregiving, family, intimate relationships, health, um, you know, these are all valuable things. All of them are very important, but some of them are going to be a little bit more important to you than others. And so setting up that hierarchy inside your mind, what do I want most out of life? Which things am I, you know, which valuable things in life am I willing to sacrifice for a little bit in order to put forth more effort into the things that really mean something to me? And that's great if your, if your values kind of line up well with your partner's values. When it was over, Chris was plenty bitter about having wasted his 20s in such an incompatible partnership. He spent a lot of time after the divorce blaming her for ruining his life. I think that's unfair because he chose to bring her into his world. As with the last chapter, he provides a story about a couple and their very tumultuous relationship, which ended in divorce and how that fits into the context of this chapter. So in this chapter, he's talking about values and how a man and a woman got married that he dealt with and um, their values were extremely incompatible and those incompatible values ultimately led to their divorce. 
And I thought it was very interesting that he's talking about this man blaming this woman for having different values than he did and ruining his life in his own words. I think that's interesting because I think a lot of men in the Manosphere do do that. Not all of them. Not every guy in the Manosphere. Uh, the Manosphere is a many colored thing, so there are many different types of men who end up in there. But there are a few guys running around out there who have had experiences where they've gotten together with a woman and they've broken up with the woman and they have a tendency and anybody who gets a divorce is going to do this not anybody but a, a, most people who get divorces are going to do this they're going to start blaming the other partner it was in the case of a woman blaming her husband it was his fault for this it was his fault for that he, it's his fault for this and in the case of a man it's her fault it's her fault for this it's her fault for that it's her fault for this other thing interestingly um my husband and i had a rocky patch in our marriage um at a point not not too long ago and we were discussing a divorce we didn't get one which is a really good thing because we're both much happier together than we are apart but in the process of discussing a divorce it was really interesting because I noticed myself kind of looking at it and saying well I think this is his fault <laughs> And then it was like, well, that's not a particularly productive line of thinking, but it's very easy to fall into that pattern. And so I think a lot of people do it. Um, so I thought it was interesting that this this uh, this man that he's talking about in this particular chapter story um, blamed his ex-wife for their divorce. And as he put it, um, I think that's unfair because he chose to bring her into his world. Um, it's it is that concept of frame and maintaining frame when they first got together she was very agreeable and he had a very strong sense of what he wanted and what his values were and so he was pursuing his values which is good she didn't have a particularly strong sense of her own values but he was exciting and so she just kind of fell into his frame immediately and you would think especially after reading Rolla Tomasi's work that if he maintains a strong frame and she just falls into his frame very quickly and very clearly and cleanly, that means they're going to be super compatible and everything's going to work out. And in this particular example, the opposite is what happened. He had a strong frame, he's pursuing his career and his goals and his values, and she starts to realize that his values don't have anything to do with her values. And she starts drifting away from him, and he doesn't understand why. And ultimately, it leads to a very messy divorce. Understanding what means something to you, what matters to you, and what you value is important. You have to understand it about yourself, and you also have to understand it about your partner. Separate goals from values. Goals come and go. Values endure. For example, maybe you value health and want to run a marathon. The marathon is a goal. You either complete it or you don't. But there is no end point regarding health and fitness. You can always improve your knowledge, your endurance, your diet. There is no finish line. There is only the joy of the journey. That fact should feel comforting rather than discouraging from any value you truly esteem. This is one of a list of helpful tips that he has regarding values and understanding your values and what to do with the knowledge of your values. Like once you figure them out, what do you do with them? Um, this chapter is full of that, and it is absolutely beautiful and very enjoyable to read. His narrative is always quite refreshing and pleasant. I had a good time reading this chapter. This was very pleasant for me. There are a couple other things to remember here. First, a couple's values don't need to be identical. How boring would it be if they were? Variety is fun, and differing values can be wonderfully complementary as long as they don't collide. Incompatibility is the problem, not variety. This point really stood out to me, and I wanted to mention it, I wanted to pay special attention to it. Your values do not have to line up perfectly 100% with your partner's values. They have to be compatible with your partner's values. Um, not everybody is going to enjoy the same things, and not everybody should enjoy the same things. As long as the things that mean a lot to you don't directly clash with the things that mean a lot to your partner. And that's one of the things that's wonderful about this story that he included in here, which I haven't mentioned at all in this chapter, but he has this story about this couple whose values clashed and they ended up getting a divorce. 
he could illustrate very well just through the story of this couple how values can clash. The man in the story really valued prestige and power and his career, and he was really pursuing those goals and those values that he had. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to start a family. She wanted to have a, some kids. She wanted to live a nice, quiet life. It was exactly the opposite of what he wanted. It's not bad if you want different things. It's bad when the things you want directly compete or, or do not mesh well in any way with the things your partner wants. Then you start having problems because you have to pick between the two of you who gets to have what they want most. And that can be extraordinarily difficult. One more common source of friction between the genders is the topic of nice guys versus bad boys. Oh yes, here it is. Here it is. Quite a few men complained about women preferring jerks over nice guys like themselves, and plenty of women complained about nice guys seeming so meek as to be pushovers, which is a big turnoff to most healthy women. But I think it's funny that he mentioned it. It's like, yeah, don't be a nice guy. Like, don't fall into the nice guy paradigm. If you're wondering whether or not you are prone to nice guy types of thinking, No More Mr. Nice Guy is a very good book. If you start reading it and thinking, gee, what the heck is this guy talking about? You're probably not prone to nice guy types of thinking. If you start reading and thinking, oh my god, this person has read my mind and put it down in a book, how did he do that? That is a book that you need to be reading. Would those old instincts assess the high earner any differently than the good hunter of long ago? Research says no. Men who are highly agreeable, which is not the same as nice, make less money and are less frequently considered for advancement than men of low agreeableness. My husband is actually a very disagreeable man. <laughs> Which I think a lot of people hear disagreeable as a personality trait. Like he's talking about the big five personality traits and one of those traits is agreeableness. And it exists on it exists on a spectrum, so you have highly agreeable and then highly disagreeable, and people tend to live somewhere inside of that spectrum. You don't want to be too agreeable because that causes problems. You can be a pushover, and you can seem weak, and it causes problems, which is what he's discussing here. But you don't want to be too disagreeable either because then you're just an asshole. And so, you know, people live somewhere in the middle of the spectrum and they kind of, you have outliers farther and farther, but usually they kind of fall somewhere in the middle, um, a little to one side or a little to another side. If you're too high in agreeableness, you seem like a rather weak person. Um, my husband is a pretty disagreeable person, which honestly is kind of beneficial because he is a man. He does live in the business world and he's tough enough to say, I don't agree with you. He's he's tough enough to speak up and and speak his mind even if it's not going to make the people around him happy and that can be very very beneficial in the business world. I remember I remember at one point I was pregnant and we needed more money. We didn't have enough money and he went to his boss and asked for a pay raise. And <laughs> and uh, you know just very bluntly, very straightforwardly, you know, we need more money. I'm doing the work. I'm doing a good job at what I do. We need more money. Um, it is exactly that hunter-gatherer mindset. And it was very important. Like, we were trying to stay afloat. We were trying to pay the bills. We were trying to afford food. If you are a very agreeable man, and some men are very agreeable. I've met plenty of very good men, high-quality men, who are prone to agreeableness, Sometimes it helps to practice sharpening that disagreeable side of yourself and kind of balancing yourself out in that agreeable versus disagreeable spectrum. You don't have to be an asshole all the time because that's no good, but you have to make sure that you have a backbone so that you're not leaning too far into the agreeableness side of the spectrum. This is good for women too, but it's beneficial for men when it comes to dating, which is why I think he's mentioning it in this book. Don't be the, the spineless nice guy. Grow a spine. Um, <laughs> that sounds horrible. I'm sorry, that sounds horrible, but it's true. You have to have some toughness to you. You have to have some spirit in you. You don't have to be a raging asshole. You just, you just need spirit.
It also means we men need to not only recognize our own short-term biases, but those of women as well. We need to know that unless she's done the work and research you're doing right now, she may not be using the most reliable criteria to size up men. So basically, knowing your own system of values is extremely important and it will make you attractive to potential partners because you know what you want and you know where you're going. This is very similar to that, you know, that concept of having a sense of frame. This is what you're building up in, in this chapter in, some, in many ways. Um, but it's not enough if you do it. She has to have done it too. She has to have her own set of values aligned. She has to have her own ideas about what she wants in life. She can't just be drifting along, riding the wave of life and going, hmm, you seem nice, and having no clue what she actually wants for herself. This kind of knowledge also gives you an advantage over other men. Women aren't ruling out nice guys, they're ruling out unassertive guys who show an overly compromising nature that suggests they're unwilling to defend what matters. If a sense of safety is something a woman seeks in a man, you can't blame her for relegating to the friend zone any man who doesn't openly define and defend his own values. This is, I think, what people like Rolla Tomasi are talking about when they talk about frame. This is a better way of understanding frame. Like a lot of guys, it's kind of like, well, just, just build a sense of frame and you're kind of floating around like, what do I do with that information? Like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go do this. Um, why? Fuck it, I don't know, but I need to have a sense of frame. That doesn't help you. This actually helps you. It gives you an idea of where to start when you're trying to build up a sense of frame. What do you actually value? What actually means something to you? You're not necessarily gonna figure it out overnight because life isn't easy and answers aren't simple especially important answers, it's not gonna come to you right away, but if you start thinking about it and going through that process of asking yourself, what is most important to me? What do I want most? And, and ask yourself, what have your actions in the past demonstrated about what you actually value and what's actually important to you? In the past when you've had to compromise, I think he actually says this in the book, for all I know I'm paraphrasing. If in the past you've had to compromise, what did you choose? Did you choose your career or did you choose your freedom? Did you choose your family or did you choose your own, you know, sense of adventure? What did you choose in life? Where did your values take you? Particularly when you have to make compromises because life is a series of compromises. What values drive you forward? And that helps you to form this sense of frame where you do know I am I am all about this. This is what I want in life. This is what I'm pursuing. This is where I'm going. Honestly, now that I'm looking back at it, like just as I'm talking about it, I had a very clearly developed sense of frame by the time I met my husband. And he had a very clearly developed sense of frame as well. We both knew what we wanted out of life. And so when we met each other and we got to know each other, um, it wasn't one of those mysteries where we were both kind of floating around or one of us was kind of floating around going, well, you know, I'm just kind of riding the riding around, going with the flow. It was like, I want this. This makes me happy. This is important to me. And he had the same, I want this. This is what makes me happy. This is what's important to me. And so, you know, in getting together and in forming a relationship, it was very easy to pinpoint, well, what do you want? You can have those conversations. Well, do you want to get married? Do you want to have kids? What are your thoughts about money? Like, if you've thought through, what are my values, those other questions fall into place that much more easily. And you can actually have a comfortable conversation about those other questions. It's not going to be one of those awkward, well, I don't know how to answer this question. I don't know how to talk about this. It's like, oh, I know exactly what I want. It's much easier. You don't need to be a disagreeable jerk to be attractive. As one astute reader of an early draft of this book pointed out, being an asshole only attracts women who aren't really worth committing to. To attract healthy women, a man needs to possess a clear set of values he's willing to fight for. When she sees you defend what's important, she learns that you are capable of defending her. 
This made me so happy to read. This is so beautiful because I've I've spent so many years of my life being constantly confronted with the, well, do you like nice guys or do you like assholes? And it's always this very, very black and white kind of picture. And somehow, with all the white and all the black, they completely fail to, like, to hit the point. I don't want an asshole. Nobody wants an asshole. And I don't want a nice guy who has no spine and no sense of self and no flavor or texture. He's just bland. Nobody wants either of those two things, and I certainly don't want either of those two things. And so I remember being asked that in strip clubs, like, well, which one do you prefer, the nice guy or the asshole? I bet you prefer the asshole, don't you? And I'm just sitting there like, can I pass on both of those options because they both sound terrible? I still think they both sound terrible. I wanted somebody who had a clear sense of frame, not an asshole, and somebody who was strong enough in his own spirit and strong enough in his own sense of self to say, this is what means something to me. This is what I value and this is what I'm going to stand up for. My husband and I, we used to talk about, you know, is this a hill you're willing to die on? And I had never heard that phrase before I met him and he explained it to me and it made perfect sense, you know. Is this something that you are willing to really like buckle down and fight for. It is very important to be willing to fight for the things that matter in life. Otherwise, otherwise it really doesn't matter, does it? If you want to minimize the chances of romantic disasters, one of your best hedges is unapologetic honesty about who you are and where you're going in life. He has so many more tips and hints on how to make relationships work and how to set up your own system of values. I cannot go over them all. The chapter is too long. They're all really, really good. I could talk about them for forever. Um, please buy this book. It's a wonderful book. I strongly recommend it. No, I am not being paid to say this at this time or in any way monetarily um, supported for endorsing it. It's just a good book. Buy the book. It's a good book. That's the end of this chapter, and I'm going to call it a night. It is very, very late, and I am trying to be responsible about getting sleep and getting plenty of exercise and eating healthy food and not going crazy, and um, I'll talk to you guys later.